Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar, Low Testosterone Online Clinic. My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Also joining the call for MinMD today is Karen Bono. Karen will be joining us to help answer any questions relating to MinMD during the Q&A session. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Tariq Hackey. Dr. Hackey is a board certified urologist who specializes in low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, minimally invasive penile implants, vasectomy reversal, testicular sperm extraction, and much, much more. Dr. Hackey is located in Atlanta, Georgia, and today he's going to cover the symptoms of low T, low T diagnosis, testosterone treatment options, effectiveness of testosterone replacement therapy, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our presenter, Dr. Hackey, over to you. Thank you, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thanks for the nice introduction. I wanna thank everybody at MenMD, uh, Carrie and everybody else, uh, and Karen and, uh, and you for setting all this up. Testosterone replacement therapy. So testosterone is a hormone that's produced usually in the testicles in a man and the adrenals in a woman, right? So usually testosterone spikes in, in the early morning time from surges in FSH and LH. Um, the levels of testosterone will vary. And if you look at nice studies done by Morgan Toller and other people, uh, physicians, uh, they've seen that there's that nice diurnal pattern. And that'll actually go away as you age. So men go through andropause at around 60 to 65. You get a flattening of that curve. Um, you know, I think most men don't really think about going through andropause. They just think about, oh, women go through menopause. And, you know, it does happen to men, too. Um, puberty, you will get a spike of, um, you know, the uh, testosterone uh, in the teens to 20s. And then, you know, it'll, uh, you know, slowly drop as you age. And then when you get that sixth decade of life, you'll have that flattening of it. Testosterone is really important for regulation of libido, muscles, energy, focus. Um, uh, it also affects hair growth, bone mineral density, um, and it can affect sleep. Um, the, uh, you know, a lot of these guys that have sleep disturbances and will get into this, uh, you know, work at night or they have other issues like this that can, that can cause that. So next slide, the low T slide. So what is low testosterone? So hypogonadism or low testosterone has several flavors uh, or types I'd like to think about it. So primary uh, hypogonadism or low testosterone is because you do not produce enough testosterone. This is the, uh, not the most common type. This is from you lost a testicle, somehow um, you've had radiation, trauma, the testicles have been injured uh, from infections. So the, the testosterone producing cell, the Leydig cells, are not producing um, testosterone. Um, then there's another type of testosterone, uh, low testosterone, low T. Um, we'll use the term low T and low testosterone interchangeably. Uh, um, it's called secondary, which is usually, it's more common than that is the system itself is not running hot enough. Um, the brain is not telling the testicles to fire enough uh, and generate enough testosterone uh, because the hypothalamic set point is not right, the pituitary is not working well. The, um, the brain itself may have had an injury. We're seeing a lot of people when they came back from Afghanistan and Iraq have, you know, head trauma, shrapnel injuries, and the pituitary was not, uh, the brain was not secreting enough of the hormones to tell testicles to go. We're also seeing a lot of like uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, and uh, uh, alcoholism, and uh, shift, what I call shift worker syndrome caused low testosterone. Um, you know, if you look, uh, it's more common, uh, I think, in the West to have low T in the secondary hypogonadism uh, category, 
because we have a lot more of the high cholesterol, you know, obesity, diabetes, and we also have a lot of this like light at night. So how do you diagnose low T? So usually it's defined as having a testosterone under 300 nanograms per deciliter. Um, and usually insurance companies want two different values. Um, and, you know, if you're under the age of 40, uh, Dr. Lipschultz uh, has done a nice study initially showing and it's been reproduced uh, that if your testosterone is below uh, 400 and you're under 40, then you'll have low T symptoms. Uh, and that can even come with ED and that ED will be reversible when the, the testosterone is raised back up again in both categories. And it was only 17% of the guys that have that reversibility. The, um, you know, these are usually insurance wants too low lab values when they do that. What are the symptoms of low T? So you're going to have increase in fat, decrease in muscle, um, decrease in energy. You'll have a fewer morning erections. You may have exhaustion. You may get erectile dysfunction. There may be infertility associated with it, with reduced sex drive. You may have increased risk of depression symptoms, decreased bone mineral density. So testosterone is really important in that department. Next slide. Let's go through the treatment options. So we talked about the diagnosis. So the treatment options, next slide. You know, um, there are many, uh, and testosterone treatment options have been around for, you know, many, many decades. People were initially crushing up adrenal glands of animals and testicles of animals and injecting into themselves to see what it did. You know, um, there are um, topicals, gels, um, the gels you apply to your shoulder or your body, those can um, be transferred. Um, you want to apply those every day. Um, you usually only absorb about 10 uh, to 15% of whatever you apply topically on the skin. So that's definitely something to remember there. It won't get you higher levels, but it does get you daily control. I like this for usually older patients or patients that want something very simple. And I usually tell patients to avoid their partners for uh, several, you know, five minutes or so before they put their deodorant on, which they want to put their deodorant on always first, right? And then, you know, make sure they wait for the deodorant to dry, then put on the gel and then put their shirt on. So it adds an extra five minutes to their morning. Um, you wanna put it on places where people don't touch so you don't get transference. And I don't recommend this for guys with kids. Um, usually there are female doses of testosterone. The topical gels are nice. Usually, I don't know why, but women are usually more okay with applying a cream every morning. They're like, yeah, it's okay. Patches are available. I know Andrew Derms had their patch out. I'm not a huge fan of it. We're in Atlanta. and guys get sweaty and, you know, it just the patch falls off. It's got to be reapplied every 24 hours. If you look at injections, it's the most common, cheapest way to uh, administer testosterone. It also gives you the most control. Um, there are many types of testosterone. Um, there are also, um, you know, many different, you know, ways to even inject it. And we'll get into that later. The pellets are implantable rice seed uh, types of testosterone that we just put underneath the skin. Um, and then there are also, there's a nasal testosterone, and then there are also testosterone boosters, um, and natural supplements, which we will get into at the end. Next slide. So testosterone topical gel. So the testosterone gel you apply usually on the shoulder or the inner thigh. You want to apply it in the morning. Um, it's a nice, simple testosterone replacement. That's usually, I like it for women and for older gentlemen that are, don't have any little children around. And you really want to avoid that transference. That's really a problem. You've also got to make sure you apply your deodorant beforehand and you thoroughly wash your hands afterwards. It's a nice uh, way of applying it and then adding it into your daily regimen. And it's needle-free. It's nothing you sniff. You don't have to go see a doctor and get something poked and then shoved underneath your skin. It's kind of nice in that, in that way. It's very simple. Um, next slide, uh, injections. So testosterone was historically injected, right? We were first started injecting testosterone and it's a nice cheap way of administering and raising testosterone values. Um, usually this is done at the house. Some people will go to their physician's office because they don't do injections. There's an auto injector now, it's called Zoyosted. Um, but you know, I think that, you know, once the patients learn how to do it and if they can do it subcutaneously, it's even better. Usually I have my patients draw the testosterone with an 18 gauge needle. It looks like a big bore needle. And most patients are like, well, I'm going to inject that. I'm like, no, cause it's going to make you bleed. Right. So then you can change, um, the syringe to either a 23 or a 25 or a 27 gauge needle, um, and do subcutaneously in the belly or intramuscularly in the thigh or in the buttock or in the upper outer delts. Um, 
These self-injections are very easy to do. Usually I administer them once or twice a week. Um, testosterone recipient is the bioidentical, usually um, most commonly administered uh, type of testosterone. It's got a peak half-life uh, about three days and a trough out at about 10 to 14. So it's, a, it's usually a weekly injection for sipinate. Um, it's usually in sesame seed oil. I've had one patient in the last nine years have an issue with sesame seed oil. I had to get them grape seed extract. It's much harder to get. Um, the, uh, the Another form is testosterone and anthate. It's a little bit quicker ester. It's got a one to two day onset um, and it's got a, uh, about a seven to 10 day offset. So it's a quicker, it's a better subcutaneous injection because I think it's quicker at both onset and offset. Uh, then there's also testosterone tripunate, which is a day onset and it's out by the second day. So you're injecting three or four times a week. Um, the nice thing about injections is you don't have to, trans you don't have to worry about, oh, I, I, I'm going to transfer this to my daughter or my son, um, you know, and uh, you can kind of skip your doses really quickly, right? But the testosterone injections are going to, you know, you're going to have higher peaks and troughs. So you've got like a sawtooth weak pattern and patients have to be okay with that. You're also going to more likely to have with injections, at least in my experience, have more of what we call secondary polycythemia or blood thickening. Right, so you know, whenever you inject testosterone, um, uh, or you administer underneath the skin, or you apply it to the uh, the pellets, you can have the red blood cells and the bone marrow uptick to make more red blood cells, and this can cause thickening of the blood, called secondary polycythemia. And the treatments either hold your tea or donate blood. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, getting the right regimen down is really key. And I have patients that inject every morning. And I have patients that inject once a week or twice a month. It just depends on, you know, what they what they're looking for in their their life and what they would like, um, you know, what's what's going to work for them. Next slide: the pellets. Pellets are nice because they're simple, and usually guys come in because they're like, and sometimes girls do, because they're like, look, I really don't want to worry about a needle. I don't want the pain. I don't want um, to apply creams. I just want you to give me the testosterone. It's in my body. It dissolves and then um, it goes away. Um, as far as the pellets go, they come in uh, usually 80, 100 to 200 milligrams. Um, there are also pellets that also have the estrogen blockers built into them. Uh, that's kind of nice if they have the anastrozole built into them because then it'll block the estrogen and doesn't make a liver pass um, orally uh, when you're taking the anastrozole. So that's kind of like a nice plus there. Um, the um, Usually I, you know, do between three to four months when I usually uh, put the pellets in. Uh, usually I like to use lidocaine with epinephrine um, locally so they don't have any bleeding. And I usually go right where above the buttock and uh, below the belt line. So it's really important uh, to make sure it's in a comfortable place. You can also go on the side of the belly. Um, I'm not a big fan of that area because, you know, and I just find it harder to tunnel subcutaneously there. I think you know, in between where you sit on your butt and your back, it's a nice area that you don't really use, actually. If you were thinking about it, you're like, oh, my gosh, that part of my body, it's in between where the chair meets the, the back of the chair. And, you know, that's a nice little space to put some stitches and, you know, it's not going to really pop out. And it's a nice soft fat right there. Even skinny guys and gals have a little bit of butt fat right there that I can kind of get into, even if they start losing weight. But if you go on the sides and they lose their love handles, they lose the muffin top, you're like, crap, where am I going to put this? Um, it doesn't uh, uh, work immediately, so the onset's about two or three days, and um, it takes, uh, you know, usually three to six months. Now, the, the nice thing about pellets is it's simple. The problem with pellets is you kind of really don't know what your dose is going to be until you kind of just kind of try it. And you're like, okay, I was great for two and a half months, and I felt like crap. Okay, so give you more or see you sooner, right? Um, you know, so it's kind of a hindsight's twenty twenty. but once you figure it out, it's much easier because you're coming in quarterly or biannually for your pellets, which is kind of nice, I think. Um, but you know, it's definitely nice. You definitely want to don't want to get into the muscle. You can get some bruising. Um, I've seen people have pellet extrusion if they don't put the pellets on far enough. Um, I tend to use the 100 milligram pellets because uh, they're. I think the 200s are pretty pretty bulky, and you can kind of feel them underneath the skin if you're touching because they're a little bit thicker, but the 100s and the 87s are, are pretty good. Um, there's a nasal testosterone. I know, I don't think there's a slide on this in the PowerPoint. It's called Nintesto that you can sniff and you sniff that usually two to three times a day. Um, 
that does not cause the blood thickening that we talked about earlier. It's the only testosterone that does not do that. Um, the um, the Zoyosted, going back a slide, um, you know, if you want to run back a slide, is an auto injector that's also available that just shoots the testosterone into you. Um, moving on to the testosterone dietary supplement. So testosterone is produced from uh, cholesterol. Believe it or not, cholesterol is actually uh, the way, 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 way back progenitor. So when, um, you know, men and D and I sat down to design the testosterone support, we were kind of thinking to ourselves, well, what are the precursors of testosterone, right? So you can think about it as, you know, pouring water, uh, you know, down a slide, you know, you're going to get some of the water to go where you want. Some is going to go on the sides of the slide, but most of the water is going to go where you want it to. So if you look at that supplement, it's going to have DHEA in it, which is a precursor to hydroepiandrosinedione, right, uh, to testosterone. So you made sure we had large amounts of DHEA uh, to kind of fill out the supplement, you know, and supplement the the uh, supply. Because if you think about it, if you're making testosterone, you're going to draw cholesterol, pregnenolone, and DHEA into making your tea, your own natural testosterone. So you're going to have lower stores. So what better way to build testosterone than to have lots of ample supply of the raw materials to make it? So when we decided that we were going to make this, we you know we knew we wanted DHEA in there. I think that's you know really important um, you know to make sure we have a lot of upstream materials to make this. Um, we want to make sure that we have a natural supplements in the system to help support testosterone, uh, like Indol three and Maca, right? And then uh, we use things like DIM and the grapeseed extract to uh, help with um, aromatization or estrogen rise. And I've got great responses for patients on testosterone with just taking DIM itself. You know, um, so what we said, hey, let's put it into the supplements. You can take this supplement. It'll have everything. And you could say, well, why is the zinc there? Well, I guess most people don't really think about this, but where is testosterone actually transcribed? The receptor for testosterone is not on the cell. It's in the cell. Where? It's in the nucleus. Well, whenever you open DNA, you need zinc to open the DNA. So this is actually a really smart thing. So the guys, pharmacists and I were sitting down like, hey, look, how do you open up the, the sequence to run testosterone? Well, the receptor is a protein that you need zinc fingers to run the DNA transcript. So that's why the zinc is in there. So there's a little bit of uh, you know, that little science we just put in there just to make sure we could, uh, you know, make sure we could, you know, make our supplement different from everybody else's. Um, this is a supplement that's over the counter. I think MenMD, uh, you know, sells it. It usually takes about 60 to 90 days to get the full effects of it. Um, I think that this supplement, you know, um, you know, is a nice way of naturally pushing up your testosterone. Um, in a way that, you know, it's not going to be, you know, needing peaks and troughs. It's going to run your own system a little hotter. Um, you know, it's not for women that are pregnant. It's not for, you know, uh, transgender women. I'd say if you were a cisgender man or a transgender man, you could take this. I don't think I'd recommend it for men that have not gone through puberty yet as their hormones may be different and you, you don't want to mess with the system until it's stable because when you've gone through puberty, then you're going to slowly go down that slide unless you watch diet and exercise, right? So how are you going to naturally raise your testosterone without taking a supplement? Diet and exercise is all you've got. As you remember, as you age, that number is going to quant fall downwards until you hit 60. So this is kind of a way of kind of pushing yourself up naturally with diet and exercise to kind of help you out. You really don't want to, you know, mess with the system while it's, uh, going, we're going through puberty and, and going forward there. Um, next slide. So testosterone replacement therapy, how effective is it? You know, I think, you know, we're really good at replacing testosterone. I think for men and for women too, I think men MD's got some nice options for gals too. Uh, I think that they've been left behind. I think ACOG and, you know, some of the gynecology folks really haven't picked up the baton there, but I know some urologists, endocrinologists, they, they'll definitely help help gals out, you know, even raising female testosterone because, remember, it's a driver for libido in men and women. Um, you know, most of the supplements uh, take several weeks to slash months to really kick in. The injections take days. The nasal is hours, right? And uh, the pellets is a couple of days, usually two days. And the cream is hours again, and then it's offsets hours. So it's pretty effective. 
um, it'll increase your um, muscle mass, right? So, you know, who does not want more muscle, right? It'll decrease fat. So, you know, um, there's nice studies by Farid Saad, S-A-A-D, and he's done looking at uh, men with diabetes, and he's actually seen them go from, you know, taking insulin back to metformin and, you know, uh, being able to take people that are pre-diabetic and roll in the clock back just by putting them on TRT. You know, so testosterone replacement therapy can, you know, can increase muscle and decrease fat right then and there that helps you out. Um, we know that it'll help with libido, uh, and sex drive, morning erections, energy, better focus, better bone mineral density, better blood sugar control. It'll also make you younger. And the reason is because, you know, if you think about it, right, and, and you drop your testosterone down, you're going to have all the reverse things that you want. It's going to age you and also mentally age you as well. Um, the uh, light at night issue is, is I think, big. We, we all have phones and electronics and, you know, we have people that are shift workers, firefighters, uh, police officers. We got people that are up at night and they probably shouldn't be, but they have to be, right? So, Remember the beginning of this lecture, I was talking to you guys about light at night and how at nighttime you get this LH surge and FH sur FSH surge. And those brain surges will cause the testicles to be turned on. So you have a normal diurnal variation. So if it's rise of testosterone in the morning, will drop off nicely. And if you're up at night, there's light in your eye, you won't get that spike anymore. Because think about it, your body didn't go to sleep and see darkness. You went to sleep and light was there. So you still got a blip, but you didn't get the darkness. So there are photoreceptors in the eye. And you're like, dude, I thought we were going to talk about T. You're talking about the eye. There are photoreceptors in the eye that actually just pick up ambient light. And they kind of tell you, okay, it's getting darker and darker and darker and darker throughout the day. Right? And so blue light is what the sunlight's rays are that, that that receptor relies on to say it's getting darker, it's getting darker, it's getting darker. We need to think about going to sleep, which is then going to increase your cortisol, increase your FSH, your testosterone. If you don't get that, then you don't get it. So I see a lot of guys that come in with secondary hypogonism where the, the brain just isn't accelerating the testicles to make more because they're up at night. Um, you know, another thing that we didn't talk about, you know, it's also another risk is, is chronic pain, right? That can also blunt in that, that diurnal variation of testosterone. So um, there are definitely risks, right? It's a hormone. Um, so testosterone's risks are, you know, acne, bloating, breast tenderness, rises in estrogen, right? And you, um, that's why we put the DIM in the supplement. That's why the, the, the anastrozole, the estrogen blocker is in the, um, the pellets. Not everybody needs an aromatase inhibitor. I usually put guys on aromatase inhibitors if they're usually overweight. You know, if they're, if they're obese or just slightly overweight. Uh, if they're slightly overweight, I usually won't. If they're skinny, I don't put, it, put them on. If they're overweight, I'll put them on a low-dose estrogen blocker or aromatase inhibitor. Um, you know, you also have to be careful from uh, the water also. It has a lot of PFO, PFOAS in it, which also aromatizes as well. Um, so estrogen rise is definitely one of them, but we can combat that, right? You can have uh, testicle atrophy while you're on uh, testosterone replacement therapy, and that's usually irreversible. Um, you can also get a thickening of your blood, and you may need to donate blood. And we talked about the secondary polycythemia, the fact that your blood's thicker because the testosterone, and, and the injections are most guilty party, although this will happen with creams, it'll happen with pellets, it'll happen with everything except for the nasal one. Uh, it'll just tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells, make more red blood cells. Uh, and the, the, the way back from that is donating blood or, um, you know, dropping the dose down of testosterone. Um, if your blood gets thick and you don't donate, right, you'll, you'll be at risk of uh, DVT or clots from the legs or it'll go to the lungs. Um, uh, there's also, you can also have high blood pressure uh, from this as well. Um, it, what's interesting about testosterone, and, and this is on the slide, is um, it does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. It does not increase the risk of breast cancer. It does not increase your risks. If you do have prostate cancer, it depends on what type. Sometimes some types are sensitive to testosterone, sometimes they're not. If you look at uh, like 
old thought that we used to have in like the 90s. If you had prostate cancer, we took you off testosterone replacement therapy immediately. You know, like, oh, it doesn't matter what type of prostate cancer, we just took you off. And it was really just silly the way that we did that. If you look at um, hormone replacement therapy now, I will usually leave a guy who's got, you know, low risk or very low risk prostate cancer on testosterone because, um, you know, a lot of guys are getting prostate cancer. It's one of the more common cancers in men, but it's not hormone sensitive and it wouldn't change and they're probably going to die from something else and they might as well, you know, live their life and we'll see if it becomes a problem. We'll pull the trigger to treat it if we need to. Um, but, uh, you know, it doesn't increase the risk of, of prostate cancer. That's huge. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it just if you're going to do testosterone replacement therapy, you need to do it with a provider that can follow you, right? There's also an increased uh, risk of having enlarged prostate, right? Because it's going to accelerate dihydrotestosterone levels and uh, male pattern baldness. And we have treatments for all those things. Um, but, you know, if you ever have any of the symptoms like the shortness of breath or the coughing blood from the PE and the DVT, then, you know, definitely go to the emergency room, seek healthcare. Uh, provider, but if you're followed by a healthcare provider, an endocrinologist or a urologist that knows what they're doing, uh, then you know you, you can definitely be sure that they're going to follow you to make sure that, that what you're doing is safe. Um, I think uh, MedMD has got a little thing here on storage, and I think they're right there. You know, you want to make sure your vials are sealed. I like to store my testosterone in uh, in my supplements in the refrigerator. If you think about it, you put your bread in the refrigerator. You might as well put your uh, your supplements in the refrigerator. Before you make your salad, you put your lettuce in the refrigerator. So everything kind of just like stays um, for longer, you know, in the half-life. If you put in the refrigerator, we, we already know that it cools everything down. Next slide. Um, I guess this is another slide, just CYA. Talk to your physician if you have prostate cancer. Um, I think it's really important to let us know as physicians what type of prostate cancer you have. If you have more aggressive types of prostate cancer, then I think it makes sense for you to, you know, stop your therapy until you get your prostate cancer under control and then resuming it at a safe time. Um, I do not think there's a reason to end TRT, you know, because you have low levels of small, minute prostate cancer that you, you know, you could possibly even pass away from, you know, something else. That has nothing to do with this. Next slide. Um, which TRT is right for you? I think that, you know, um, you should have a conversation with your physician, right? And I think it's going to start with what you're comfortable doing. If you say, I have a phobia of needles, <laughs> let's talk about the gel, the pellets, and the nasal, right? If you're really like, I really want to sniff something three times a day, then, you know, you know, we got to think about what's simple, right? Pellets, injections, you know, you don't want to have the testicle shrinkage. You don't want the headaches of TRT. Maybe the supplement's better for you. And so I think they have a nice slide here going through like gels, you know, you know, consideration for each one where, you know, the gels have got the risk of transference, the injections have got this peak trough, peak trough, right? And you're more likely to have side effects, the negative side effects of testosterone, like the thickening of the blood, the acne, the bloating, the breast tenderness, because you're more likely to have high levels with the injections. The pellets um, just require you to come on into the office, and that may be a pain in the butt. You may live out of state from the provider that you selected. The supplements are nice because they're natural, right? And you can stop them whenever you want. Uh, you don't really need a healthcare provider to be like, well, we need to check your hemoglobin. Something's going on here. You know, you can go donate blood right now. So um, the I think that, that ends. If you have the next slide, it, it goes to the, the question questions. All right. Uh, first question comes up. Uh, is there a, a home test that is available and reliable to test low T? Um, I know there are cheek swabs. I don't know how they're reliable. They are. I'm not going to tell you that I know the answer. I don't, you know, because um, I think as the pandemic has shown us that we need to get more um, creative with how, how we approach healthcare. Um, you can Harken back to, um, I'm forgetting the name of that lady right now, the, the lady that had the one drop of blood, um, you know, with, with her lab. And that, that just, that was like, a, they, I mean, she got, she got in a lot of trouble as a lawsuit. She's going to get thrown into prison. You know, if you're going to get your labs checked, just go to a reputable lab. I mean, Quest LabCorp uh, is all over the United States. 
it's it's a it's a thing it's a stick in the arm they don't need too much blood you can ask them to use pediatric tubes but there are orals that are available but it's just not as accurate um, you know i just think that the best the best way to proceed for especially in light of what happened to that other that other company um is just going through the what's going to work because you want to make sure your labs are done you want to do them in the morning um, if you look at the studies at a Mass General, you want to do it before 1 p.m. Your insurance is usually Blue Cross and all those others. They want it before 11. I don't understand where anesthesiologists and pediatricians that have been working for, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield can come tell me how to practice medicine, but that's just how it is. Yeah, does testosterone replacement affect mental health? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've got... Um, I've got several patients that tell me, hey, I, um, I feel like I have more mental clarity. And um, I've got patients that have told me that they sleep better from this and they feel less depressed. And there's actually nice studies looking at depression questionnaires. And we give men depression questionnaires both before and after TRT therapy. And they'll have a, uh, a less, uh, they'll be uh, less depressed. They'll have a drop in their depression questionnaire um, if they had you know, testosterone that were like 100, 200, and you just raise it up to four or 500. Um, they feel better. Um, they have more confidence. They have better erections. It just changes them mentally, you know, um, you know, from soup to nuts, you know. So it, there's definitely a, a factor of that in there. It's a really good question again. All right. Uh, next question here. How do I bring my T levels up without taking any medications? Are diet and exercise the best way? So um, I think that we we kind of uh, talked about that in the in the webinar. I think that you know you, your only tools that you've got to raise testosterone naturally are going to be um, a proper diet. I, I don't think in the West we 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 have a lot of carbohydrates. We don't eat right. Um, a lot of refined sugars in our diet. So. Just look at what you're eating. If you're trying to, you know, lose weight or, um, you know, you're trying to increase in muscle, you want to first of all know that 50 to percent of the way that you look is at the meal table. It's just that simple. It's not fun, um, but it's 50 percent of the way that you're going to look at the meal table. 40 percent is is the hormones here, and 10 percent is genes, right? So most of it's not. Can't blame your parents. I mean, you know, on most of it, you know, it's it's going to be you know, what you're doing directly, you know, you're eating donuts, you know, having a bunch of sugar, that's going to be a problem. Um, you know, as far as exercise go, if you want to raise testosterone, you need to think more about weights. And if you look, there's a nice study out of Harvard that came out like what, two, three years ago, just before the pandemic, 2019. And they were looking at, at linear muscle growth and they biopsied muscle growth. And they looked at two different cohorts, guys that were lifting high weights, low reps, and guys that were lifting low weights and they were doing high repetitions. The growth curves were linearly the same. It was, they both got to muscle failure, it's how they got to it. And if you watch some of these uh, bodybuilding like uh, Netflix and things like this, uh, I think Amazon's got some more too, you'll see these guys, you know, their, their bodies don't make it because they're lifting high weights, you know, um, and the joints just aren't designed to do that. So let's say you're squatting, right? So you're going to squat um, 100 pounds, right? The knee will see seven times that weight. So your knee is actually squatting 700. I could put 100 up uh, easy, but just have to think about the joint, you know, and it's easier for the joint to see that lower weight and get more repetitions, right? And then they have the muscle fail that way than it is for you to do large high, high weights. So focusing on the weight regimen is going to definitely increase uh, testosterone. Outside of, you know, the supplements and the testosterone replacement therapy we talked about, you know, that's really the only, you know, vices you have. But you're also fighting, um, I think I just alluded to perfluoro alkylphosphates and sulfates. So we know that the water in, from the EWG data, so if you type in EWG.org uh, in Google and you type in EWG.org PFA, PFAS map, you can actually pull up the map and you'll see that every single test site in the United States was positive for these, um, what are called forever compounds. Uh, these compounds are found in the water from flame retardants and uh, different firefighting, um, you know, uh, in, uh, substances they use the foams. 
um, runoff, uh, and they estrogenize, they aromatize. So um, what we're seeing now is I'm seeing a lot of guys having, you know, higher levels of estrogen and, you know, plastics, especially the soft, like plastics, they also exude um, estrogen as well. So, you know, you have to think, I think about the environment too is also kind of we're, we're contaminating ourselves to the environment as well. And, you know, your ways around that are, you know, going to be to avoid the plastics when you can, you know, um, trying to make sure that, you know, you, you know, watch what you're eating, where you're drinking, where you're eating and, you know, make sure you exercise regularly. All right, got two questions coming up about libido. First one, tests show that my testosterone level is normal, but I have suddenly completely lost sexual drive. Are there other factors? Definitely, that's a, a that's an excellent question. Um, so testosterone is the primary driver for men and for women of libido, right? And so what I'd ask that 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 person is, you know, if their free testosterone is normal. So I saw a patient, uh, you know, on Wednesday. His testosterone is 464, but his free is six. So he has low T, right? You know, uh, and I told him, I was like, look, we can rat naturally raise up your testosterone. You know, I don't know if I can give you TRT because your insurance is not going to pay for this, but we can talk about other therapies, you know, and things that you can do. But you have low T by fundamental, by fundamentally, your free testosterone is low. So I always look right there at the free testosterone because it's really important to give patients and healthcare providers, a healthy understanding of how testosterone is actually formulated, right? So when you look at testosterone, it's drawn from the blood and then they spin the blood down, right? And that basically slaps the testosterone, different compounds in the blood along the wall of the vial. Then what do they do? Well, they throw it into a machine that uses like light rays to refract and tell you, oh, there's this much testosterone, there's this much SHBG, but then they have to calculate how much of that testosterone was bound to the SHBG that was not available for your cells to see, right? So, um, you know, they, they calculate what your cells see. So there's a total testosterone number and there's a free testosterone number. Contrary to what most guys think, you're not a switch. You, sh you usually, you know, a lot more goes into, uh, you know, sex drive than just testosterone, right? Uh, there are other things like depression, mood, your partner, interest levels. Um, and there are other um, compounds uh, that you can use to try to increase libido. I know that Addy is out um, and we use that for libido in women and men. Um, I know there's a nice clinical trial for men and they're using half a tablet before bed of the Addy. Um, the Vilesi has also been used. Uh, I use it in men um, for desire, specifically for men with desire with, with normal testosterone, right? Because that's what it's used for hyposexual desire disorder in women. And, you know, men, if they have normal hormones, the same problem. Uh, I think the compounds PT-141 or bromelanotide, and that works as well. Um, but that's definitely correct. Testosterone is not the end-all and be-all, but it's a nice place to look. And I like to look at morning erections. You know, if they're younger patients, they still have good erections. And you can say, okay, you're missing morning erections. You're 22 years old and you have issues with getting, maintaining erections. Okay, we got to look where, you know, you know, you know, hearing hoofbeats, I'm thinking, of course, is not zebras. You know, uh, let's check testosterone and see what's going on there and, you know, go from there. All right. And the second question for the uh, low sex drive, I'm 74 years old and not getting erections and to have a low sex drive is it possible to have ed and low t or is the cause more than likely one of these issues and not both so that's another really good question so um usually um it's usually both uh usually because you're over the age of 65 you're going to have a flatter curve so you won't have that higher testosterone value at 64, you or 74, uh, you've collected what I like to call barnacles. You've got high blood pressure, probably maybe even some diabetes creeping in there, pre-diabetes, you know, high cholesterol. Those things can affect the caliber of the artery and can affect the artery from opening. So I would see your local urologist because you have ED and symptoms of low T, get your labs drawn and possibly have a penile ultrasound and uh, inject, um, you know, inject you with some bimix or trimix to make sure that we can figure out, you know, what's happening. Um, there is a 20% or 17% chance that um, you have low testosterone that's causing your ED. 
Um, but, you know, I think that at 74, it's more than likely related to the other things that have uh, happened to you over the years, like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, things like that. You know, so, you know, uh, low testosterone, you know, some of those common symptoms for you to go see your primary care doctor, uh, you know, diabetes, um, you know, and, you know, obesity, um, you know, these are some of the common reasons for you to go see your primary care doctor. These are causes of low T, so. All right. Next question here. Is there an optimal T level? If I go above that level, what are the risks and benefits, if any? So if you look at the testosterone, uh, like ranges, they'll say 300 or 400 to 1,000 to 1,100. It's, it's a range. Um, I would say that if you look at a therapeutic natural testosterone, it's not going to go above 1,100, right? Not everybody needs to go that high, but that's if you ask me what's like going to be in the ranges of what a normal human will be in, it'll be 300 to 280 to uh, about 1100. When you have higher testosterone, you're going to have more of those symptoms, right? And you have to figure out what's going to work for you. If you have a history of stroke or, uh, you know, cardiac stents, I don't want you above 600. You don't need to be that high, right? Um, if you're, 40 years old and you have low T and you don't feel good at 400, 500, and you used to be at six, 700 when you were 20 years old, then absolutely we need to get you up higher. But when you get up higher, like we were saying earlier, you know, you're going to have the acne, the bloating, the breast tenderness, the rises in estrogen, the uh, thickening of the blood, need to donate blood. So you're going to have these symptoms. Um, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, higher blood pressure, things like that, you're going to have more likely to, to run into issues with um, the negative side effects of testosterone when it's high. And if you look at some of these bodybuilders that are doing like five cc's a week of testosterone, you know, they're doing large volumes of it, um, you know, like thousand milligrams, you know, they don't, they don't live long, you know, it's not healthy to have that high level. You know, we want to replace it, not abuse it, you know, and, and testosterone definitely has that uh, ability to more is not always better. That's how I, what I tell patients, like, can I go up on my dose? I'm like, you can, but then the risk reward is, is, is diminishing. It doesn't, it doesn't get better as you go up. All right. Next question here. Can I do injectable testosterone and the supplements at the same time? Yeah, and, and, you know, that makes sense, right, because it's actually going to stimulate your – because, you know, you're injecting testosterone, but your body's still going to produce some low level on its own, and you can kind of, you know, promote, um, you know, the adrenals and supplement the adrenals on, on their own. It'll also allow you to be on natural aromatase inhibitors, you know, with the DIM and the Indol-3. So it's not the end of the world um, to, to take this. I think it's great. It's a, it's a nice dovetail. I would tell you if you're on testosterone replacement therapy, you know, it, it's an excellent dovetail to nicely take this other supplement to replace some of the um, aspects of your own T therapy. Because when the engine's running low, you're not going to call for more, um, you know, supplies. But if you have more supplies, you're gonna, it's going to slide into more testosterone on your own while you're on the supplements. All right. Next question here. Do you recommend TRT after getting a penile implant? If you have low testosterone, um, I recommend it. Uh, I recommend uh, T therapy regardless of it. If you have a penile implant, if you have an artificial urinary sphincter, if you have a prostatectomy, if you have had prostate cancer, if you meet the criteria for low testosterone and you've talked with your physician, you're ready to take this on, then I'm all for it. So the answer would be yes. All right. Next question. At age 80, am I too old to start testosterone replacement therapy? No, I think um, my oldest patient's 92. So um, I have a gentleman, 81, actually, I just saw him on Monday. And he asked me the same thing, am I too old? And I said, you know, you look, you've got a penile implant in, you don't look 80, you don't act 80, so let's not leave you at 80, you know, because he's stronger on it. And, uh, and sometimes these older guys like that, I'll put them on a whiff of a dose, like I'll put them on 0.25 once a week of, of testosterone. They just don't need as much. Um, their bodies just, you know, just don't need as much testosterone. And I can put them on nandrolone, especially on the implant, and they won't get erectile dysfunction. They get the nandrolone in, and they won't have joint pain. Like, hey, Dr. Hackey, I don't have that joint pain anymore. This is excellent, you know. 
all right, if you start a TRT treatment, will I need it for the rest of my life, or is there a possibility of regaining my natural testosterone levels again? That's a slippery slope question. Um, it's a, that's a tricky one, right? So, you know, the longer you're on T, the longer you need T, because if you're on testosterone replacement therapy, as you age, your testicles are shrinking, right? So if you think about it in the long term, if you've been on testosterone for a long time, your testicles are small and had you never started. So I'd say the short answer is if you start testosterone replacement therapy and you came off and you didn't stay on it for years on end, you could probably come off with diet and exercise and you could probably gain, as long as you lost weight and you worked out, then yeah, you could probably come out on top. Otherwise, for the majority of men on testosterone replacement therapy, no. I tell patients when you start it, stick with it. Okay, kind of follow up on that. Are there any um, bad long-term effects from using any of the TRT options? I mean, I've seen guys complain that the pellets can cause like puck marks in their butt area. Um, you know, you know, you, you've always, you got guys complaining about doing the injections and pain at the injection site. Otherwise, I mean, no, as long as they're being managed properly, you know, that's really important that like they're not abusing the testosterone, they're being followed correctly. Most guys are really happy on it. I'd say like 90, 95% of the guys we have like absolutely love being on T and, you know, it changes their life. It just brings them back, you know. Absolutely. All right, next question here. Can testosterone gel be applied over tattoos? Yes. Um, I don't think that would, that would affect uh, the um, absorption. Okay. Uh, next question here. I've been on TRT treatments for a few years now and have noticed a shrinkage in my testicles. Is this normal? Um, it's not normal for them to shrink, but it's a side effect of TRT. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's a side effect because the brain hormones are shut down, so they're not talking to the testicles anymore. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, as you stay on testosterone continually, you're going to have that slow shrinkage of testicle volume. A nice way around that is cycling on and off testosterone, um, taking the supplements and Clomid and cycling on and off. And sometimes if you can get it, I don't know about now, Pregnal or HCG is a nice way of combating that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, I got a few uh, prostate cancer uh, topic questions to go over with you now. So how long sure. after hormone therapy um, for prostate cancer does testosterone return to normal range? Does it ever return to normal? It, it, I mean, it depends on um, what they did, right? So if you get um, if you get uh, Lupron injections, sometimes it never comes back on. I've got guys that have taken finasteride, and their testosterone never recovers. I've had some guys that have had Lupron, and they've never recovered. Otherwise, usually I'll have patients wait uh, usually about 18 to 24 months before I put them on TRT if they've had prostate cancer. Um, especially if it's more aggressive. It's one of the milder Gleason 6 ones. I'll put them right back on it after about six months. You know, I'll put them back on TRT if they had their treatment, you know, because I just don't see a point of making them suffer. Their prostate cancer wasn't aggressive. If it was more aggressive, I want them to wait it out. You know, um, that being said, if the patient's like absolutely adamant they want to go back on TRT and their PSA is undetectable, I'll try TRT for the patient, even if they were higher risk. But I usually warn them heavily that I recommend waiting it out. You know, it just depends on what type of therapy they had and if they had to have the Lupron, which blocks testosterone. All right. Next question here. Are normal T levels different for post-prostate cancer patients? Would be if you were on the hormone blockade. So if you were on Lupron, I would anticipate if the system's been blunted, then you won't get that nice diurnal response of testosterone, especially if you're under 65 and you got therapy and you got the got the hormone replacement therapy blocking your testosterone down, I wouldn't expect you to have the same diurnal effects because you've dampered the system. All right, and last question about uh, prostate cancer here. What options are there for patients after prostate cancer and hormone therapy to get their mojo back? So a really good, I think we kind of covered this already, um, a really good uh, therapy is either the Addy or the, uh, the Vilesi, the uh, bromelanotide. 
those are two good therapies that you can use that will not affect prostate cancer. And you can wait the uh, two year period without having to really worry about, oh my gosh, I'm stimulating my testosterone. I had aggressive prostate cancer, you know, I'm worried about it. And I like to use that in ovarian cancer too. Let's not leave the girls out of this. You know, if they have had ovarian cancer, they can't be on HRT. And if they've had prostate cancer, you usually kind of want to wait it out to make sure their PSA is down. And especially if it's more aggressive disease, you know, you can use these other alternatives from testosterone, um, the Addy and the uh, Vilesia, the PT-141. They're definitely excellent options for libido. All right. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the event here. So we're going to ask a few more questions and then we will go ahead and wrap it up. So next question here. Great. Uh, do testosterone replacement therapies cause hair loss? Well, it increases DHT, right? So, um, you know, it's it can, well, uh, you're right, usually the hair loss, um, you know, is usually genetically related to, you know, the mother's side through the, you know, the, the genes. But, um, you know, you know, there's also stress. It can also affect it as well, but it can accelerate your dihydrotestosterone levels and you can have accelerated hair loss. It's not going to, not going to all fall out overnight. And there are options. I mean, you've got minoxidil, um, there's, um, uh, latanoprost, there's finasteride, um, there's, uh, even, uh, uh, some other new sprays that hit the CXXC protein, um, and I think they're designing some other stuff that's that's coming down the pipeline to help increase hair growth. But um, there are a couple. There's a D, DBM um, um, with, excuse me, valproic acid. So there, there's different sprays and there are different other therapies for you there. All right. Uh, is there another option for lowering hemoglobin besides giving blood? No. I have patients okay. come trying to tell me to take a, an aspirin. The only way to drop your hemoglobin is to donate blood, right? And that's really about it. You have to wait for the, the red blood cells to die off. That's 120 days. If you have too much red blood cells, you really have to go donate or All right, stop. Last question. Sure. Last question here. How does TRT affect fertility in men under 40? So there's a nice... I guess we're still writing the paper. There was a nice presentation that I presented at uh, Society of Sexual Medicine uh, last uh, November. And we're writing an article up where we had people on testosterone replacement therapy and we made them fertile. Uh, we gave them gonalef, which is kind of expensive. And we just turned the brain back on again. It turned the testicles back on and they were normal fertile males. So uh, testosterone will block um, FSH and LH as it's going to negatively feed back to the brain. Um, when it does that, it'll turn off the testicles, hence the shrinkage, and also it'll drop you down and make you either low sperm count or no sperm count. So I used to tell my patients they're subfertile while they're on TRT. And what we did was we turned the system back on again by going and giving the person to inject the, the gun left or the FSH or competent FSH into the system. Um, you know, it's kind of expensive, but that therapy will actually turn the system all back on again. It kind of like hijacks the system, turns it back on again, and makes them fertile. And um, it seemed to work. And we had 10 guys with eight pregnancies and two sperm retrievals. We had nobody fail that, that protocol. So we're writing that paper up right now. Wow, that's really interesting. Cool. Um, all right, with that, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Hackey for taking the time to present today. We'd also like to thank everyone listening in for attending this Minimum Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and that you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options. Uh, there are more resources in the Resource Center on MinMD.com. Visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and more. You can also call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal to schedule an appointment with a MinMD clinical case manager. If you don't have a specialist for your, your uh, sexual or urinary tract health, MinMD has a new physician finder service. Go to MinMD.com and click Find a Physician to get started. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references to helpful resources and links to each after the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we will see you at the next one. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.